Hi again, and uh, welcome to this uh, last video on neural networks. So in this video, we'll look in particular at techniques for training neural nets for image recognition. All right, so a couple of videos ago, we introduced a motivated neural nets by in particular this deep learning breakthrough, uh, where suddenly in 2012, this AlexNet a deep neural network suddenly uh, greatly improved the performance of image recognition software. So in particular, it uh, gave this huge increase from around a 25% error in image recognition in this image data, image net data set to maybe around 16%. And then since then, it's just been uh, improving. So we'll try to uh, dive into some of the ideas or techniques that are part of this AlexNet. Right. So by now, these deep neural nets are, are better than humans on, on this image net data set, but still not on the wild in the sense that if you take pictures with your phone, uh, then the um, humans are still better at, at uh, saying what's on the image. So in image recognition networks, one of the most uh, popular uh, ingredients is what's called a convolution. She has a picture of a deep neural network architecture where it says that there are a bunch of convolutions, deep convolutional neural net uh, feature extractors. And uh, so we haven't yet talked about what these are, but this is what we'll try to, to cover in this video. Okay. So the ones we've seen so far, these fully connected uh, feed forward neural nets, they're super simple to describe. Uh, every neuron in one layer is connected to every neuron in the next layer, and then they just feed uh, forward with a bunch of hidden layers, uh, depending on the depth of the network. And we saw how we could use a full or a dense weight matrix between each of the layers to describe the weights on these uh, edges between the neurons. Uh, one issue with this architecture in particular for image recognition is that, well, there's no sense of locality between pixels. Uh, so let's try to see what do we mean by this. So, so here's a fully connected uh, feed forward neural net, uh, just showing a little piece of it. You have uh, two input neurons here. You have some hidden layer that's large here, didn't show all of it, and so on. So this is a small part of a, a feed forward neural net. And here you have two neighboring uh, pixels in the image, so they're sitting right next to each other. And they're feeding into uh, every neuron in the next layer. Now, the issue is if I go far away from this and look at some other neurons sitting way over here, maybe this uh, pixel all the way down here in the lower right corner of the image, then it's connected in exactly the same way to all the neurons in the next layer, right? So somehow uh, the network doesn't really distinguish at all uh, whether two pixels are close to each other, whether they're far apart, right? So it's not really exploiting any sense of locality between pixels, which at least as humans, we believe this is some, an important thing when you're looking at an image to use locality of, of, of pixels. Things that are nearby each other kind of uh, belong together. Okay, so that's an issue with using these feed-forward fully connected neural nets for image recognition. So convolutions is an idea uh, that will try to uh, remedy this. The basic idea in a convolution is that it's going to search or look for uh, small features in the image. And one thing that one would like out of this convolution is that it should be translation invariant. Uh, so in particular, right, if you if you look at this picture here, whether the cat is on the right side of the picture or on the left side of the picture, it should still, the, the, the neural net should still predict a cat, right, that it's a cat that's on this image. So somehow convolutions, we would like them to uh, kind of do the same, regardless of where on the image the cat is positioned. And yet we would still like that if you apply these convolutions, which I haven't said yet what it is, uh, it should somehow uh, preserve information on where the feature is in the image. That's the basic idea of a, of a convolution. So, so let's try to see what that is. Okay, so to be a little bit more formal, uh, let's just keep it simple and look at grayscale images. So then each of the neurons in the in the image, in the input, uh, they will take in a pixel and uh, just the, the color intensity of that pixel, right? So zero being completely black and white, one being completely white, which means we'll take an image like the, uh, the one here and then we will actually think of the neurons, uh, the input neurons, as actually being arranged in a 2D grid like the images. So, so kind of this will be, each of these grid cells will actually be a neuron, and we're actually kind of keeping this uh, locality here. As you can see here, right near the top border here, there are very low values. This is very dark parts of the picture. You can see the, the pictures up here very dark. You have some really bright things down here around the nose of the cat, and so on, right? So you can see that uh, we'll try to represent these uh, color intensities by just numeric values, and we will actually place them in a grid like this. So maybe the black, the zero here is maybe the, the black in the pupil of the eye of the cat and so on. 
So, so we'll just keep the neurons and actually remember that they're sitting in this grid. So there's still some sort of locality here. Okay. Now, each of these entries of this grid is going to be an input neuron, right? So we're going to have a neuron for each of these entries here. And what we're going to do now when we do a convolution, then a convolution is specified in typically by a parameter k. And k is typically an odd number. And then uh, the convolution is given by a k by k matrix. So here's a k by k matrix. It's a three by three matrix. And it has uh, values in the entries, right? So this one has minus ones at the edges and an eight in the middle. Okay. And now, okay, so this is an arbitrary choice for now. And we'll see later on how, how can one choose these convolutions. Now, the idea is if I have such a convolution matrix, then what I'll do when I do a convolution is I'll slide the matrix across the input. So this is much smaller than the input here. So let, what does this mean, right? So here I have my convolution matrix, right? Minus ones uh, on the border and an eight in the center. Then I start by placing it in the upper left corner of the input. And then uh, I take this, this part of the matrix and I'm just gonna compute basically the inner product between uh, these entries here and these entries here. So basically I'm gonna align them entry-wise. So I take the minus one and multiply it to 0 0.2, the minus one multiplied to the 0 0.2, the minus one multiplied to 0 0.2, this minus one with the 0 0.2, the eight is multiplied with a 0 0.3, giving us this 2.4 in here, minus one with a 0 0.1, giving us this minus 0 0.1 and so on, right? So I just multiply them entry-wise and sum it all up. This gives me a 0 0.9. And then I'm gonna put that value up here in the top left corner. Okay. Now what I'm going to do now is I'm going to slide uh, the convolution one to the right, which means now it has a new center and now I'm going to align them again, right? So I'm going to multiply all these values entry-wise in particular this eight, for instance, is multiplied with a 0 0.1, showing up as a 0 0.8 over here in the sum. I add it all up. And in this case, I get minus 1.0. Okay, so minus one here. I keep sliding. Uh, this time the eight is aligned with a 0 0.2, giving me a 1.6. And totally, if I sum it all up, I get minus 0 0.1 and so on, right? So I just keep sliding the image all the way down uh, the first uh, the first kind of shifting that you can do until you reach the right edge of the image, uh, creating all these, these values here. Then I'm going to move it one down and over to the left. So I'm going to start over again, but one uh, row further down. I've aligned my image and I again do the convolution like I multiply the eight with a 0 0.2, the minus one with a 0 0.5 and so on. And I sum it all up and I keep doing this until I've slided this convolution matrix across the entire image. Each time I've reached the end of a row, I move it one down and start over again, which gives me this smaller uh, picture with new values uh, in the entries. Now, so now that I have this, this new one here, uh, what, has this, what effect did this really have? Uh, and if you think about what's happening when I do this convolution here, what's what's going on here, right? So in some sense, you can see that if I align it on a, a three by three uh, part of this image where all the pixel values are the same, then it's going to give me a zero, right? Because I get eight times eight, eight times the middle pixel minus the surrounding pixels and the eight of them. So, so in some sense, if, if this image is completely the same color or intensity here, it will give me a zero. Or otherwise, if the middle pixel, for instance, is very different from the surrounding ones, maybe it's much brighter, then I'll get a high value. And maybe if it's much darker, I'll get a low value here. So this is, a, in some sense, what we call an edge detector. So it checks if the middle pixel is very different from the average pixel in this neighborhood. Okay, so, so what I've done now, if I've applied this, this convolution here, then this was the original input image. Now I have a new image over here, right? I can again think of this as an image. And in some sense, this new image has higher level features uh, where really what we are storing in the image is uh, in some sense edges. So it will highlight where there's a big difference between neighboring pixels rather than just the individual colors of pixels. So it's computed something more high level, kind of like an average or um, and, and neighboring region, but accounting for this middle pixel being very different, right? And I guess the reason why you typically choose this as an odd number in this k by k is just that then there's a, a unique center, right? That can center this pixel on one of the original uh, pixels. And uh, as you can see here, right? We talked about before, we would like 
uh, to do something that's translation invariant, right? So whether the cat is in the left part of the image or the right part of the image uh, shouldn't really matter. And you can see here, right, if I'm sliding this convolution, the local effect that I'm doing, the local computation is exactly the same regardless of where I am in the image, right? So I'm kind of looking for the same things across the entire image. Right? So that's the basic idea here. Uh, and also, right, you can also see that you're kind of storing the, the output, so it'll keep the sense of locality, you'll, you'll store the edge where it is, right, you'll, you'll remember when you slide it, you remember when the output, where did I see this edge in some sense, okay. Now, okay, so one tiny annoying thing about this uh, operation here is that the image shrinks a little bit, it got, you can see here now it's a six by six image before it was a, an eight by eight image. And what you typically do just to avoid this is to do padding. So in particular, if I do a K by K convolution for some odd K, then I'm gonna just kind of create a frame of zeros around my image. Uh, so K minus one half zeros uh, out in each direction. Uh, so in this case, uh, if for three by three, I will do a two by, divided by two. So one frame around the, the image here. So then I'll just kind of pad with zeros. And, uh, and then now I can, center exactly on every input pixel of the original image right now before i couldn't center a three by three convolution on the top left corner but i can do that now i just include some of those zeros okay so so this is just which means i can center exactly on all the original input uh, pixels so the new image that i get out will have exactly the same size as the input image right so i can in particular place it in all these uh upper uh, all these corners so I have the same output size. So let me just show you what actually happens if you apply this particular convolution on uh, this grayscale image of the cat. And what you get out is something that looks like this. And you can see that it has really detected edges in some sense, right? You can clearly see uh, the edges of the image. And so this, in some sense, we have a kind of more high level representation of the image, if you will, uh, now showing uh, where are the edges in this image. That's the basic idea in, in one of these convolutions. Okay. Now, if I want to use a convolution inside a neural net, then the basic idea is that the parameters that I include in my neural net are these uh, are parameters inside the convolution, right? So here I'll have nine weights that I can choose. This is the input image, right? So these are the input features, right? Those are not ones I can choose, but the trainable parameters are these uh, weights that are sitting in the convolution. So, which means, right, when I want to compute this, this concrete pixel here, uh, this corresponds to computing the alignment here, W1 times X10, uh, W2 times X11, W3 times X12, and so on, right? So I just compute this, uh, and then I sum them all up. And, and one can think of it as, right, and really this is a neuron, right? These are input neurons, the nine input neurons here, right? We have an input neuron for every pixel of the image. Now in the next layer here, I have, an, again, a neuron, here and one can think of it as uh, these there are only edges coming from these and uh, nine neurons going into this one neuron right so it's not a fully connected network anymore this particular neuron is only connected to those nine uh so only nine incoming edges instead of a fully connected neural net and uh the signal that comes into this neuron is exactly what we would expect, right? W1 times X10 plus W2 times X11, W3 plus times X12, and so forth, right? So this is exactly, it's basically the same as before. The weights are just described by this convolution instead, uh, the convolution matrix, and it's only connected to a few of the input neurons. And in particular, those input neurons are sitting locally together, right? Similarly down here. So if you think about, if you look at this lower corner, right? And this, this pixel down here in the output, and we'll see that the signal that comes in will be W1 times X46, W2 times X47, W3 times X48, you sum it all up and so on, a different signal. And the important difference between uh, here and when we had the fully connected neural nets is as you can see, right, the weights are shared, right? It's the same weights that I'm using on different neurons. So there's sharing of weights uh, in different pieces of the input. But as you also already know, right, from back propagation, uh, this means in some sense, if you look at the computation graph, then these weights here will be used in multiple places, which means that there'll be multiple outgoing edges from them. But that backpropagation, we already know so how to handle it, right? We, we do backpropagation, we compute these uh, gradients of partial derivatives on the edges, we just have to sum them up. That's all that, that matters, right? So we can still do backpropagation. Okay, so 
then if you have an image like this one that's not grayscale, you actually want to make use of the colors, uh, then what we create is what's called a channel. So what we're going to do is we're going to have one channel for red, green, and blue. Right. So, so basically, this means that you'll take your input image, you'll turn it into three different images with the amount of red, green, and blue in each of these uh, positions of the image. Right. So each pixel, remember, right, any color uh, color pixel can be written either as red, green, or blue, or like a combination of red, green, and blue, and we'll just have a channel for each, giving the amount of red, the amount of blue, and the amount of green in each of these uh, pixels. Okay. So basically each of them will be a number from zero to which would be black, but then one would be either completely red, completely green, completely blue. And then we'll just feed in those. Um, now we have three different uh, values describing every pixel. And what we do now, if we want to do these convolutions, then when we have an image, instead of thinking if it's a W by H image, so a width and a height, or before, if we had just a uh, grayscale, we'd only had one neuron for each. But here we're kind of thinking of it as a, like maybe a cube or tensor or something where we have a W by H by three grids. So and sometimes we're kind of stacking these three color ch uh, channels on top of each other. And in this way, right, the, the last dimension here, the one where we have three different choices, uh, that's a channel. And there are three channels, right? Red channel, green channel, and blue channel. Okay, so now a convolution with this representation, if I have C channels, C being three in this case, then the convolution is not just a K by K matrix, but a K by K by C matrix of tensor weight. So it's kind of like this, you kind of stack on top of each other, all these uh, uh, yeah, matrices, and, and there are just as many as there are channels. Okay, and actually each of these entries have their own weight that you can train. And now the basic idea is when you slide it across the image to produce one output value, and you slide this convolution here, uh, what you're gonna do is you're gonna compute basically the inner product on the blue channel with the first of these matrices. So W1 times the first pixel plus W2 times the next. And then you're gonna add it up with the second of these matrices multiplied onto the green channel. And you got to add up the third of these matrices multiplied on to the red channel. And you're going to add the whole thing up. And then you're just going to slide it along the image like you did before. So this is going to produce one W by H output channel if we pad with zeros at least, right? So it has the same size as before. Uh, so that's what basically what we think of is that we take uh, one of these convolutions, slide it across the image, uh, and where we align, uh, where we have basically have a matrix for each of the channels. We do the uh, summation over all the channels, and this produces one output channel. <laughs> now, the basic idea is that we can now, we don't, we can also use multiple convolutions. It's instead of having one convolution tensor, if you will, uh, which is just a matrix with an extra dimension, a three dimensional uh, grid, what we're going to do is we can run multiple convolutions. So maybe we can run C different convolutions. Okay, so uh, and C is not necessarily the same as the original number of input uh, dimensions here. Maybe we can run, I say, six different convolutions, right? So if we have six different convolutions, then we're going to produce six new images, right? So six new K by K images, if it was, uh, uh, sorry, uh, W by H images. So, uh, so this basically means that, well, I could take six different convolutions, slide them across this image, which would give me six new images, one for each of these uh, convolutions. And now when I go further on, if I want to repeat and do one new layer of convolutions, then now I have C channels, six channels in this case. So the new convolution tensors or matrices would be K by K by six. So I can kind of just repeat this. And now, so each time I'm kind of feeding in each of the output channels from the previous layer, and I'm doing these convolutions across. So, so this is basically here. Now I have these six channels here. So now a new convolution matrix, which is a three by three or tensors, a three by three by six. So you have all these different parameters sitting inside. You can slide this whole thing across uh, this uh, new image with six channels, which will give you one output channel. Okay. And actually, if you do this, uh, you can actually see what's actually being learned uh, by convolution neural nets that have been trained for image recognition. You'll actually see something interesting to try to visualize what is it, what type of input actually 
uh, makes such a convolution uh, neuron fire in some sense? What gives the largest signal when you slide such a uh, convolution uh, across an image? And you'll, and you'll see some kind of interesting things uh, that these are actually the, uh, the convolutions to the weights that are sitting inside these uh, little uh, convolutions. These are the ones that actually learn by the first net of uh, first layer of a neural net for image recognition. Right, so you can see that it's really looking for different. Each of these convolution matrices are looking for kind of different patterns in the image. Right, so if it sees uh, this pattern here, it'll, it's going to output a large value. That's the basic idea, and right? it's going to output large values. And otherwise, it's going to output small values. So, so you'll basically when you train these neural nets, you'll have many different convolutions. That you that you slide across the the image you know, to begin with, producing a whole lot of channels afterwards. One for each and every one of these little convolutions. Uh, and and here I basically I just kind of just to visualize what's going on here. I try to collapse the three uh, or the three channels, the red, green, and blue channel, have kind of been collapsed to to visualize what is it, what kind of patterns is it that it's looking for. Okay. Uh, so each of these convolutions gives one channel in the next layer of this neural net, which means that if you look at it here, uh, this neural net where this comes from actually has 90 channels in the in the next layer. So if you do more convolutions on top of it, they would be K by K by 90 uh, boxes of, of numbers of weights. Okay. All right. So the idea with these convolutions, again, was to look for small features in the image, and it should be kind of a translation invariant, which it is by sliding it across the image. And it also does preserve information on where the feature is in the image, right? Because you, you're kind of outputting uh, the, the value of the convolution in the same position in the image as where it was before. So, so you just to kind of have the same effect on these two images, except that it's going to say, find the features in the left side of the image or on the right side of the image. Okay. Uh, one issue is that uh, convolutions are not so much scale invariant, right? So in, in some sense, it, okay, maybe the edge detectors are, but but in some sense, just the sliding of a fixed sized uh, window across an image is not so scale invariant, in particular like the small cat and this large cat will behave very differently uh, when you when you slide across these these convolutions. So so that's the last kind of idea that we'll also look at is what's called pooling. And the idea in pooling is to somehow zoom out on the image uh, to focus on larger features as you go along. So a, a pooling operation is uh, in general also specified by k by k, parameter k for some integer k. Um, and then it also has a function. It's a, you also have a function of k elements. And, uh, and then you have a stride s. So sorry, actually it's a function of k squared elements. So it's a function of everyone inside uh, an image here, in, inside a uh, k by k uh, sub matrix. So you have a stride, and then you have the stride s. So let me try to, to visualize. So so some popular examples of one of these functions, and again, remember, this is supposed to be of k squared elements. Uh, you could, for instance, be the max function, the mean function, and the minimum function. And what is it that you do? Let's try to, to visualize it here. So let's say I have a two by two pooling operation using the max function and a stride of two. What does this mean? It means then that I start by placing this two by two uh, uh, operator, if you will, on in the top left corner. I apply now the max function on the uh, four elements that are sitting in here. So the max function would return 0 0.3. Now the stride here of two means that how far should I move this window whenever I finish computing a value? So the stride of two means that I should shift it by two positions to the right. So now if I move my window over here, I compute the max, which gives me a 0 0.2. I move it by two, compute the max, 0 0.2, move it by two, compute the max. And now also the stride, when I go down, I also move by the stride down. So I move two down. Okay, so this means I'm down here and I output the max, which is 0 0.5 and so forth, right? So if you slide this across the entire window, I'll produce this much smaller image in particular, it's gonna be about half the size because the stride was, was two. So, uh, so basically, the idea with pooling is that um, you will often, if I have a whole lot of channels here that I just computed, then sometimes I'm going to apply, for instance, a max pooling to shrink 
the size of the images. And when I'm doing this, I'm going to do it individually to each of the channels, right? So these are not kind of stacked C ways. You just do it, you can kind of compute the max on one channel, the max on the next channel, and so forth, shrinking all the images down to about half the size, having taken the max operation inside each of these uh, little two by two windows. So I still have C channels afterwards, but the, the size of the images is much smaller. So in some sense, you can think of it, right? The observation is that if I have a stride that's larger than one, then pooling is really shrinking the size of the image by a factor of S if S is the stride, right? Uh, so, so it's kind of zooming out in some sense on the image, right? You're kind of making the image smaller, which is in, in some sense equivalent to zooming out, at least if you apply uh, same sized convolutions on the next layer, they will kind of correspond to really large convolutions on the original image. So what you often do when you have such a deep neural net, uh, then one standard building block in a deep neural net is convolutions plus activations plus pooling. So if I have an input here, for instance, this could be the red, green, and blue channel of an image, then I might have a bunch of convolutions, for instance, four convolutions, right? And they, you have to remember there has to be one for each of the channels, the stacked three by three matrices. You slide all four across the image, generating now four channels. Then you often have an activation function that you apply entry-wise here to these uh, neurons, if you will, which basically produces the same sized output, but now maybe you apply ReLU on each of the entries. And then uh, you do a, a pooling operation. So maybe uh, you do a max operation to reduce the size of each of these uh, images that you have or channels that you have left. And this is basically a standard building block. So you kind of expand the number of channels, but shrink the size of the image. That's a typical uh, building block here. So first a round of convolutions, then a nonlinear activation function, then a pooling operation. Right. So basically you give it the number of convolutions C followed by an activation function such as ReLU and followed by pooling with a max, such as the max pooling, for instance, or mean pooling with a stride of two to reduce the size of the image. Right? And this is really what you do uh, multiple times if you, and this is what's being done in, in architectures like AlexNet. So, so basically you start by uh, running a convolution across your image, it has three channels, you produce a bunch of new channels, uh, maybe using ReLU activation. So you'll have a neuron that's kind of representing a, uh, a convolution applied to, to these different regions. Then you do maybe a round of, of pooling, max pooling to shrink the images. Then uh, you could do another round of convolution to blow up the number of uh, channels significantly and apply ReLU activation. Then you're gonna do pooling to shrink the size of the images. And maybe you can do, uh, and then when you want to end up, uh, typically what you do in, in the last couple of layers in a, in a neural net is that you apply, um, a, you basically construct a fully connected network uh, at the top. So, you, you, so the ma main idea in many of these deep nets for image recognition is to repeatedly do a convolution and pooling uh, with uh, nonlinear activation in between. You do that for a bunch of times until the images have basically shrunk to something really small, but you have a lot of channels. And from there, you just build a fully connected neural net uh, for the rest of the way, uh, ending up typically, if you want to make predictions on multiple classes, you end up with a softmax layer. And this is the basic idea in, in deep nets for image recognition.